So we will now continue with another editor of a different type, if I can say so. Um, Ms. Dr. Meloni Bartlett is the head of journal and data publishing at the Royal Society of Chemistry, which is an editor of long standing and very well known among chemists for the quality of its publication. The last few years, the Royal Society of Chemistry has been developing an open access publication policy with the aim to, of maintaining solid processes of peer review. The Royal Society of Chemistry can be considered as a very traditional publisher, historically. Why and how has this editor approached the diversification of its activities what kind of support does the editor offer to the authors in these times of transition? So, the floor is you. Thank you very much. So, good morning. My name is Melanie Bartlett, and I'm going to talk to you and discuss with you about how my organisation, the Royal Society of Chemistry, is meeting the challenge and opportunities of open access. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Royal Society of Chemistry, I thought I would give you a little uh, information about us. Uh, we're the world's leading chemistry community with 48,000 international members and a knowledge business that spans the globe. We are the UK's professional body for the chemical sciences and a not-for-profit organisation with over 170 years of history and an international vision for the future. I think this is what you talked about being a traditional publisher. Um, our vision is to bring scientists together, promoting and sharing knowledge to shape the future of the chemical sciences. Um, and publishing is at the heart of all of our organisational activities. As we'll see from all the talks today, publishing is in a state of rapid evolution and an increasing number of journals are moving to introduce open access publishing into their workflows. Uh, we aim to provide readers with free access to the results of publicly funded research in particular. The principles of making scientific research as widely available as possible are strongly supported by both publishers and the research community alike. Yet at the same time, the transition from traditional models of publishing to open access is quite a hard process. And there's quite a potential impact on science in many areas. The challenges and opportunities for publishers, such as the RSC, is to negotiate this transition and to succeed in the face of increasing complexity and to help our society members and authors to remain relevant in this world. Learned society publishers, such as the Royal Society of Chemistry, are in a strong position of influence and take a leading role in shaping the future for the benefit of communities we represent. We provide leadership in navigating the open access environment and we're well placed to understand the particular publishing practices of our communities within the chemical sciences. We also play an important role in forming dialogue on open access policies, engaging with governments and funders and decision makers in both the UK and globally. The RSC is committed to making open access a reality through the developments that it's taking. But we want a fully sustainable publishing environment for researchers which maximises the dissemination of their knowledge. We recognise there's several different routes to open access. We've already talked about gold, green and hybrid. And other innovative models will appear in the near future. These all need to be explored and potentially developed in a complementary way to make sure that we look at them in the same ways as we've looked at our previous 200 year history. What you can see is that the Royal Society of Chemistry along with many of our partners share the view that increased access to the results of research is necessary to maximize their use and impact. 
As a thought leader within the open access environment, particularly in the UK, we are looking uh, to encourage funding to be made available to support authors during this transition from reader to author side payments. Uh, this is particularly important where authors actually don't understand how they can get their work funded in open access. The goal route for open access is not without its problems. Uh, and these sources of funding are often not clear. What we've done at the RSC is recognise that these difficulties are something that we share with the community and we've been looking for innovative ways to alleviate these problems. Many of you in your institutions will have had sight or knowledge of a product that is called Gold for Gold. We recognise that research asks researchers are being asked to publish open access but don't have the funding to pay for it at this moment in time. It's good to hear that there are initiatives already being put in place that will make this transition easier. In the interim, what we've done is provide support for the funder-led evolution by looking at ways in which we can encourage our community within the chemical sciences to trial open access and what we've been doing is making voucher codes available so that our authors within the chemical sciences can publish open access for free. This also alleviates the issues of double dipping, which we will talk about during the day. While many of us are going to talk about the differences in publishing models, APCs and some of the challenges. What I really wanted to focus today was on some of the ways in which the RSC is actually helping authors to navigate this complex area. And something that you may have read about during the last two weeks is actually the RSC has launched a chemical sciences repository. The first phase of this is actually an open access article repository. Um, if you look at the reference here, it is, should go live today. If not, you'll actually come to a marketing landing site where you can register your interest and we'll send you information when the site goes live. But do keep on trying it today and it should be up later this afternoon. For the moment, we're just actually looking at the Royal Society of Chemistry articles within the repository. Um, but we're hoping to work with other publishers, institutions, and funders to make this an option for chemical scientists. Authors will have the option for automatic deposition and from that purpose we're actually looking to uh, develop partnerships with other organisations uh, which want to deposition of uh, research funded by them. We're also part of the CHORUS project which is the clearinghouse for open research in the United States. And we hope to partner with other European funders as well to make this as easy as possible. Our aim is really to alleviate this process for researchers and our authors. CHORUS is a joint project by publishers and funders to address the OSTP memo on public access in the US. So specifically looking at federally funded research so as part of that pilot scheme, what we're looking to do is to easily deposit all of the work that is currently published on an open access basis or through green open access where um, authors have deposited their final versions directly into the archive that Chorus is building. What we're moving into now is an area of open science and the drive for open innovation and open knowledge provide real opportunities to formulate a vision for our publishing programmes in the future. In taking a dynamic and agile approach to become the definitive network for the chemical sciences information, we're fully utilising the opportunities of new technologies and formats, both the collection and dissemination of content into the interface and scientific workflows of the future. We're also talking not just about open access journal publications here, we're also talking about open data, which has really made a dramatic entrance into the research playing field over the last 18 months. 
and welcome any initiatives that help us to address um, particularly the kinds of uh, standardisation that is necessary to make uh, it entirely valuable for deposition of data. What I would like to talk about is some projects that we've already initiated within the scope of these areas. Are there any chemical scientists actually sat in the audience today? Excellent. <laughs> um, for those of you who are perhaps from a biological field, you'll already be fairly used to using tools for looking at structured databases. For the chemical sciences, we're also introducing a number of tool-based uh, provisions to help researchers not only deposit data, which will be entirely free, but also to look at the tools for integrating and linking compounds through journal publications. So really looking at the holistic picture as far as publishing is concerned. ChemSpider is the RSC's um, data and tool provider with this respect. As of the beginning of this year, we partnered with the EPSRC in the UK to um, take forward the National Chemical Science Database Service. This is working with a number of primary databases within the UK to make that research uh, fully accessible for UK academic institutions. This currently is a five-year plan funded by the APSRC, but we're hoping to actually make this a global operation to make this work available on uh, a truly international scale following the five-year development programme with them. Another programme that we're interested in is uh, working within neglected diseases and working with um, medicinal chemistry in particular, to look at ways in which we can overcome sort of humanitarian needs as far as research is concerned. Open Facts is a consortium with the European Community and the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries looking to build a portal which uh, reduces the barriers to drug discovery, both in academia and industry, and also for small businesses. The Open Facts Consortium is building a discovery platform. Um, this should be available from August 2014. This will make integrated pharmacological data freely available. What we've talked about today is really some of the ways in which we're empowering scientists within the open access environment to use new kinds of resources associated with publishing, rather than actually just looking at the ways of moving a traditional publishing regime into something with a different payment model. Um, and I welcome your questions about this today. Thank you very much. In fact, I have one first question. Um, at EPFL, we offered some vouchers to our authors, researchers, to publish at, uh, um, in reviews of uh, the, Royal Society the Royal Society of Chemistry. And we, we expect, expected um, that a lot of researchers will knock at the library door to have this possibility and in fact it didn't happen so perhaps we didn't communicate very well that's one point but do you have another explanation does it need time perhaps for researcher to adopt this new kind of uh, working with publishers i agree with you the uptake is really slow currently uh, for the royal society of chemistry before we um actioned our gold for gold initiative we actually just had a really small uptake of 0.2% of open access. Mm. With the work that we've been doing with institutions as, such as yourselves to increase the visibility and impact of open access, that's doubled for 2013 to 0.4%. So um, that's, that's quite a big increase. But 
certainly within uh, the physical sciences, we have an issue with making this a viable option at present. And it isn't just about the funding. It's actually about whether people feel that it is the best venue to publish their work. Um, that is changing. People are more engaged. People understand the processes better. And part of that process for us is making sure that we are engaged with faculty, engaged with librarians, to make sure that they have the right information for their researchers to make this transition as easy as possible. Good. We will work on it. Thank you. Oh, no, it doesn't seem to be working, so I'll just shout. It does work. <laughs> Hi. So I wanted to ask about your uh, new repository. Uh, you mentioned that uh, authors will be able to sign up for automatic detection of their articles. Will this be working for both open access and you know, closed access articles so as to try to promote green open access after six or 12 months? Um, we operate a 12-month embargo ourselves at the RSC. So um, obviously, we'll be working with different partner institutions and publishers and we'll be re respecting their embargo periods that they've placed on their work as well. In terms of non-open access publications, um, we already work with um, the Wellcome Trust, we work with NIH. Um, in the UK, we're obviously looking at the UK funders to facilitate um, deposition and the requirements and mandates in those areas. The repository is particularly focused on open access and that drive to engaging people with the process for um, understanding why open access is important for their institution and building up the visibility of those publications. So um, we'll be looking at both gold open access that is available uh, immediately, but also we'll be working with publishers, institutions and individual authors to um, make sure that the embargoed work is actually made available in the right right deposits um, when that's suitable for those in longer periods. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are the articles in your repository, will they also be made available in institutional repositories and other publicly funded uh, repositories? Our plan is to work with as many um, partners as possible to make that a, po uh, a possibility. The drive behind this initiative is actually to help our authors. As a society, we perhaps have a different drive than maybe commercial publishers do in terms of facilitating what our membership and our authorship actually want. Um, so we're really looking to be, once we've done this ourselves, we find it very easy to go into institutional repositories. We make it very easy for people to come in with APIs to be able to do that. So we'll be looking at building those over the next six months. So, so you're, you're planning for interoperability between between publicly funded and, platforms. And the first stage of that is actually with Chorus, where we are developing an API with them so that they can directly take um, the federally funded research from our repository. Yes, although they're not a publicly funded repository. So. They are not, unfortunately. <laughs> yes, it's a question about the repository again. <laughs> Uh, because uh, in a repository you can have a post um, post print, and um, the publisher is uh, editing the post uh, post print. So, is it planned that your the RSC postscript will be in this repository? Because if you rely on the authors to put the post print in uh, the repository, we know that this doesn't happen very often. Whereas you have the post prints, so you could send them to the repository, your own postscripts. Um, for the Royal Society of Chemistry publications, yes. Um, yes, we have it linked with our own submission process, so we'll be able to deposit those automatically. For automatically. Okay. Um, that is obviously more of an issue when we're working with partners, but we'll be looking at ways to facilitate that with them. But it normally depends on us having access to some kind of database of information that can be verified. Within our terms and conditions currently, it will rely on authors actually loading their final version up. But we are looking at ways with Crossref in particular of verifying sort of the DOI access for those. Okay, thank you.
We have uh, more time to, uh, some time for more questions. Um, I would have a very uh, indelic, uh, very curious uh, question about business model. Pardon? Oh, okay. No, no, go on, go on. Um, Actually, it was not a, a question, just a small comment um, in addition to what I, to, to my own presentation, something I couldn't cover. Um, uh, Royal uh, Society of Chemistry is one of, uh, since, um, since it's a professional society, you give a discount on the APCs to your own members. And um, I just wanted to let the audience know that um, actually the ERC, um, if any of our grantees uh, decide to become members in order to uh, benefit from a reduced uh, rate for the APC, like for example Royal Society of Chemistry, but in particular also the American Chemical Society, which actually offers a 50% discount. I think you're only giving 15%. Yeah. If that actually leads to a significant decrease of the cost for the APC, then we do also cover the cost of the membership fee. So maybe that not everybody is aware of that. For a one-time publication, of course, that's not worth it. But if somebody regularly publishes in the journal of a particular professional society that then gives discounts on the APC, then uh, this membership fee is an eligible cost under our grant agreements. Yes, I had a question about business models uh, for Copernicus and uh, the Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, institution actually um, pay a lot for the traditional subscription model. Um, somehow we don't understand why it's so expensive. So I would be curious about uh, your business model. How do you manage to have a sustainable business model, for example, at Copernicus? How is it possible to have some information about that? Um, yes, of course. <laughs> um, like I said, we only have uh, open access journals, so we fully fund uh, all these journals via article processing charges. And uh, but it's um, it's like that. Some of the journals are owned by um, societies or um, institutions who fully fund the journal. So the reader has no cost; mm -hmm. they pay the cost to us, us which um, the publication and reviewing and so the whole process causes, also the archiving, uh, which is like on this uh, page per page basis I mentioned before. Um, then we have the journals like just passing through the costs, um, the article costs. So that's really like, okay, they own the journal, but they say, okay, um, the, the page price is exactly the price Copernicus costs and therefore they also um, then pay the, uh, the publishing services. And then, is, um, then it's also possible for the societies to subsidize the journals. Uh, so saying, like I said, at the beginning we normally recommend to waive the, the fees uh, for, for better uptake of a new title. And um, then the costs which are caused by our publishing services have to be covered, covered by other means. Of course, um, um, there are, for example, um, from the DFG funds uh, for launching new journals, uh, but often it's like also the society itself say, okay, for example, they cross finances via the incomes from meetings. Uh, this was when we finally, uh, when we initially start the business, this was how the society, our first customer, which we worked already for 25 years about the meetings, um, and they finally decided to go also open access um, with their journals, uh, which are published by us. Um, it's they did the initial phase via cross financing from uh, um, from the meetings, and they have generated like funds for the journals. But we, after I think six years, uh, we they could sustain all the um, costs via the APC. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm Camilla from Frontiers. 
And we do the same thing. We have as well article processing charges and um, that actually works quite well to sustain the open access model. I think that PLOS ONE has shown it, BMC has shown it, that it is possible. In, in Frontier's case, we became sustainable, I believe, after four years or so. Um, if you build the right software, the right platform, it is perfectly possible. So you can make investi investment continually and be sustainable. sustainable. Yes. Mm. Okay. It doesn't mean that we run a profit or, or anything, you know, like even being a commercial publisher, mm. we invest everything into the development of the platform and, and publishing more, but uh, it's perfectly possible. Yeah, but that's basically um, the same for us. So we really can sustain all the publishing business from the publishing activities via, via the, the, the per page publishing prices. So, um, um, and um, also we, maybe we have also to say, yeah, we are a um, German limited liability corporation, but it's owned by a non-profit. So it's also not so the goal to make as much as profit as possible, no, uh, but it's, it's really about uh, providing um, so, uh, really maximum services to scientists. And it's, um, but of course we generate enough income that we also can invest in our infrastructure. Yeah, yeah and just the same with PLOS that we're, we're, we, we became sustainable in 2010, so it took us a bit longer um, than Frontiers. But um, I think it, within sort of traditional legacy publishing, um, the standard figure for a journal, a, a subscription-based journal to become sustainable is about five to seven years. Um, so that, that's a sort of comparable system just because you've got all these startup problems uh, um, with launching a new journal and, and it gaining a reputation and, and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. It's the same, same idea. Thank you. Can I just note something on that? Um, one of the things that the Royal Society of Chemistry have done is actually to look at the transition mechanism in terms of finance. And one of the things that if you've been a Royal Society of Chemistry author for a long time is that you will see that from 2008 we've gone from publishing 5,500 articles a year to publishing just under 28,000 articles this year. <laughs> and part of that progression is not only to advance sciences for the authors that actually want to publish with the RSC, but there's also a financial aspect to that as well, and that has allowed us to reduce the price per page of our journals by two-thirds during that period of time. And actually, if every chemist wanted to suddenly publish open access, our business model would actually be more sustainable under open access than it currently is <laughs> under a subscription model. So um, we would encourage everybody to um, look at <laughs> open access publishing. I, I've also heard from other commercial publishers like Wiley that the chances of them launching a new subscription journal in the future are really low because yeah. it, it's just it's not it's not a sustainable business model in, in the current environment. environment. Thank you. Are there some? More questions? No. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, we will uh, finish uh, this uh, morning. We have finished with this morning. Um, thank you very much to all the speakers who respected their speaking time <laughs> very strongly.